Hi, AnaQuest here. This is my recap for the anime Yozakura family. If you dig my recaps, don't forget to subscribe and smash that notification bell. The story kicks off with this dude named Tai, who just lost his whole family in a messed up accident with a truck. That messed him up big time and made him realize how fragile life is. Now he's all scared, thinking he could lose anyone he cares about at any damn moment. His childhood friend Misumi is feeling the pain too, mourning the loss of his family. But she tells him not to worry because she ain't ever gonna leave him. Some time passes, and we see Tai in his classroom, with his classmates coming up to him, inviting him to hang out. But he keeps shutting them down, and it pisses them off because it ain't the first time he's turned them down. They wonder why he don't want to chill with them. They figure he must be shy or something, so they decide to back off. Little do they know, he's actually happy they reached out. But he just ain't in the mood to talk to people because he's still trying to cope with his family's death. After they leave, Misumi comes up to him and gives him some grub, telling him he needs to eat well. Their classmates are watching them, and we find out they're all jealous because they all got a thing for Misumi. She's starting to worry about Tai because he's becoming antisocial saying he needs to open up and talk to people. But he reminds her how she turned down their senior Tanaka, thinking he's such a great guy. So Tai's wondering why she rejected him. But she tells him not to stress about her and says he needs to move on and chat with their classmates. She's about to feed him, but the vice principal Hirakawa swoops in and eats it instead. She gets mad, reminding him about his promise to stop snacking. But he explains he just couldn't control himself. She knows he's supposed to be on a business trip, but he says he changed his plans cause he missed eating her food. He's digging the color of her hair, but she tells him to bounce back to his office. Then he tells Tai to meet him after class. Tai's wondering if he screwed up somehow, thinking Hurakawa's a total weirdo. After class, Tai heads to Hurakawa's office, wondering why he got summoned. But Hurakawa reveals he's got a whole collection of pictures of Misumi. He admits he's taken countless shots of her, revealing he's been creeping on her from the shadows to protect her from all the dudes trying to get with her. He knows Tanaka asked her out, and we see that Hurakawa tortured the poor guy, warning him to stay the hell away from her. So Tai realizes he's in deep trouble because Hurakawa's straight up insane. The dude even threatens to kill Tai, asking if he's catching feelings for Misumi. Tai is freaking out, fearing for his life, but Hurakawa tells him not to take it personal saying Misumi is his sister. But out of nowhere, this girl shows up and hits a button, flooding the room with light, giving Tai a chance to escape. He regains consciousness and Misumi welcomes him, saying she's relieved he's alright. But he's all confused because he's surrounded by a bunch of strangers, so he starts freaking out, demanding to know who the hell they are. Misumi tells him to chill and introduces them as her siblings. Turns out the girl who saved his ass is Futaba, and she's got a brother named Shinzo, who's straight up obsessed with guns. Then there's Kengo, who's all about the cats, and Shen, who's a tech whiz. And last but not least, there's Nano, who's into doing experiments. And they got a guard dog named Goliath. Misumi spills that their family is actually a crew of spies, and Tai can't believe it. Wondering if he's getting punked, he grabs one of Shinzo's guns, thinking it's a freaking toy. But when he fires that thing, he realizes it's the real deal. They explain that being a spy is just a regular gig for them, working as freelancers, but they're struggling because the government spy is offering their services for a cheaper price. But Shin drops the bomb that their families got the best reviews on the internet, and Kengo adds that their brother Ishiro is boosting their rep because the ladies can't get enough of him. Tai puts two and two together and figures out Kengo's talking about Hurakawa. Futaba breaks it down that he's a flawed dude, but he's the top spy in the family. Tai is wondering why he's being targeted, so she spills that they got some intel saying someone wants to off Misumi. Futaba spills that Misumi almost died because of Ishiro, and the stress from that made her hair turn white. Ishiro blames himself for what went down, so he's been obsessing over her, doing whatever it takes to keep her safe. He got rid of anyone who got too close, but he made an exception for Tai because they go way back. But after learning about the intel, Ishiro decided it was time to eliminate him. Just then, the alarm goes off, and Ishiro storms into the house. But Misumi's siblings promise to hold it down and protect Tai. Shinzo spills that he sets up traps all over the house. But they all know there's still a major disadvantage because Ishiro's got mad skills. Tai feels like he's bringing trouble to the family, but Futaba tells him not to trip, saying it's always been a family thing. She drops some knowledge on him, 
saying he should marry Miss Yumi because there's this rule in their family that stops them from killing each other. She explains about this cherry blossom ring that everyone in her family wears, saying when half of it is given to the spouse, the marriage becomes official. So if Miss Yumi hands over that ring, Ishiro can't touch Tai. But Miss Yumi doesn't want to marry him because he's still stuck mourning his family's death. And Futaba respects their decision. Everyone gets ready to throw down with Ishiro, but they realize he's already in the room, claiming he wrecked Shinzo's traps. Futaba tells him to back off, but he ain't having it. So she straight up slams his ass into the ground out of nowhere, and then it's an all-out brawl. But the dude can hold his own and uses his weapon to blast them away. He demands they hand over Tai, threatening to wreck the whole place if they don't comply. But Futaba charges in, trying to close the distance, but she ends up being restrained. Shin tells the others to bounce while she gets ready to throw hands. But Ishiro tells her she ain't no match for him. But she doesn't give a damn and calls in her drones, ordering them to light his ass up. We cut to Tai, all stressed out about the others, but Miss Yumi reminds him they can't kill each other because of the family rule, so they'll be okay. She shows him a hiding spot, telling him to stay put, but she peeps that he's worried, so she reassures him that she ain't going anywhere. Ishiro manages to take out the drones and spots Miss Yumi with Tai, telling her to give him a hug, but she flips the script and straight up attacks him, so he starts using his wires to restrain her. He admits he's impressed and takes off his mask, knowing Kingu was pretending to be Miss Yumi. He knows Miss Yumi's actually disguised as Tai, and we see Tai watching them, knowing she's in deep trouble. She takes off her mask and tells him to back off and leave Tai alone because he ain't trying to harm her. He agrees, but he tells her she can't leave the house, saying it's dangerous outside. He explains his plan to clear out any threats around her, so nobody can mess with her. He's even willing to take a stab for her, showing he's ready to risk his life to keep her safe. She's about to agree to his deal, but then Tai pops up out of nowhere, telling Ishiro to let her go. But Ishiro ain't having it, telling Tai to stay the hell away from their family. Tai realizes Ishiro's just like him, because they are both scared as hell to lose what they hold dear. But Tai ain't down with Ishiro's methods, knowing Miss Yumi suffering because of him. So Tai straight up proposes, telling her to marry him, saying he'll be fine because she promised to never leave him. So she tosses him a ring, but just as he about to grab it, Ishiro steps in, saying he'll never let Tai marry her. But Tai ain't giving up, and he manages to snatch the ring, thinking about all the times Misumi looked out for him. He doesn't want to see her suffer because of Ishiro. Then the siblings show up and peep Tai rocking the ring, promising to protect Misumi. They start celebrating, thinking he's the bomb diggity, and Futaba tells Ishiro to train Tai, so he can hold it down for Misumi. The next day, we peep Tai waking up, but he spots Ishiro standing over him with a freaking knife. He barely dodges it, and Ishiro praises his reflexes, but Tai thinks Ishiro still trying to off him. Ishiro explains it's just part of their training, saying spies gotta stay alert even when they sleep. Now it's time for some exercise, and out of nowhere, he grabs Tai with his wires. Meanwhile, Misumi's getting their lunches ready, but she suddenly hears Tai screaming, so she rushes over to check on him and she finds Akiro helping him stretch. Misumi starts getting mad, so Ishiro decides to call it out. He checks the time and realizes they gotta bounce, so he straight up grabs Misumi, and they jump out the window as the whole damn house blows up. Tai wonders what's going on, and Ishiro explains that somebody planted a bomb in the house. Now they're in a whip, and Ishiro gets a report from Shinzo saying the bomb was in the kitchen, meaning they were trying to take out Misumi. Tai wonders why the hell someone would wanna kill her, so Ishiro reveals that Miss Yumi is the tenth head of the Yakuza family. Ishiro goes on to explain that the Yakuza family goes way back to the ninja days in the Edo period, and all their descendants got superhuman abilities. But there's always one regular ass person who's born as the head, even though they got no powers themselves. They carry the superhuman gene, and their kids will be able to have powers. So it's the family's duty to protect Miss Yumi, and keep their bloodline flowing. Ishiro notes they ain't care about the bloodline, but everybody just want to protect Miss Yumi as her siblings. Ishiro mentions that eventually, Miss Yumi gonna step into the underworld as the Yakuza family leader. So right now, she gotta learn about the regular world. But that also makes them a target for their enemies. Suddenly, shots ring out from behind, and Tai is losing it. But Ishiro tells him the car is bulletproof. The dudes start busting out bigger guns, but the whip swerves out of harm's way. Ishiro's worried about spilling his tea, telling the driver to drive more smoothly. And guess who's driving? 
it's freaking Goliath. Ty can't even believe his eyes. Then the dudes start shooting rockets at them. But Goliath manages to dodge them like a boss. Ishiro spills his tea, so he steps out to handle business himself. He effortlessly blocks their bullets with his wires and slices up the cars chasing them. Then he heads back to Tai and Misumi, reminding Tai he part of the family now and gotta protect Misumi too. So Ishiro plans to teach him everything about being a spy. Ishiro hands him a piece, saying his first mission is to keep Misumi safe from the assassins all day. They pull up at school, and Misumi says what's up to her classmates. But we see Tai following after her, scoping out the whole damn room. The girls think he acting hella weird, but the other boys give him props, but when they see his face, they straight up shocked, wondering what the hell happened to him. We cut back to the whip, and Tai is bugging out staring at the gun. But Ishiro's like, don't worry, we can clean that shit up if you even take someone out. Misumi tells her bro to quit playing around, and Tai is relieved to hear that. But she mentions the real threats are bombs and poison, so a gun ain't gonna help. Ishiro tells him to watch out for this bomber dude named Tamiya saying his bombs are top-notch. Ishiro even used his services before. So Tai is wondering why the hell Tamiya would turn on them. But Ikiro explains it's common for folks in that line of work to switch sides easily. Ishiro spills that Tamiya has one weak spot. He's addicted to social media. Dude even posts about how his job is going. Ishiro tells them there are hostages he needs to save, so he won't be rolling with them. But he warns Tai not to let his guard down. Saying Tamaya's posted that they're gonna be two more bombs. Tai gotta protect Misumi no matter what until Ishiro gets back. Tai scans the room, trying to figure out where the bombs could be, and he decides to stick close to Misumi. But then Tamaya drops a post saying the second bomb's in place, and Tai starts freaking the hell out. Next thing you know, he gets smacked by a ball. The other boys check on him, but he spots a figure through the window and bolts towards them. He makes it to the infirmary, but he hesitates at the door, and the nurse shows up behind him, asking if he's good. He quickly comes up with an excuse and bounces, but we see the woman smiling. We cut back to the classroom, where Misumi chatting it up with the girls, while Tai checks his phone and sees Tamiya set up the final bomb. He thinks about how Misumi learned to protect herself, like how she never eats nothing she ain't sure about and how she always avoids being alone. The boys apologize again for smacking him and give him some chocolate. He straight up scarfs it down, and the boys can't believe he actually took it, reminding him how nervous he normally gets when they talk to him. Suddenly, Tai starts feeling sick as hell, so they think they should take him to the infirmary, but then they remember the nurse ain't there today, and Tai straight up passes out. He wakes up and finds Misumi there, telling him the infirmary ain't open. Tai starts doubting if he's the right person for her, thinking he doesn't know shit about her even though they've been childhood friends. Despite being in constant danger, she always got his back. He realizes he never even thought about her feelings when he agreed to marry her. But then she straight up bonks him and says she the one who chose him. And she thanks him for marrying her. Ty's stoked to hear that. But then he spots a bomb on the ceiling. That shit blows up. And the boys think it's just one of the science club's experiments. We see Nano and some woman admiring the explosion, and we see that she was actually Kengo. Tai and Misumi survive the blast, and Tai thinks about how the hell Tamiya managed to plant a bomb in a random room. But he remembers how the infirmary was closed, so this was the next best spot for someone to rest. He realizes Misumi being targeted through his movements, and then he finds the third bomb on his own body. He figures out that Tamiya purposely announced his moves so Tai would stay by Misumi's side, making him the bomb that would kill her. With only a few seconds left, the door blocked, so Tai jumps out of the building to get away from Misumi, but out of nowhere, Ishiro catches him and disarms the bomb, giving props to Tai for finishing his mission. Misumi asks what they gonna do with the bomb, and Ishiro says he planning to return it to its owner. Nano, Kingo, and Shinzo show up, and Misumi realizes they've been watching the whole time. Kengo says they just wanted to peep Tai on his first mission. Shinzo hands over Tamiya, begging for mercy. But Ishiro straight up tosses him out the window as his bomb goes off, and everyone's admiring the explosion. We see Ishiro looking annoyed as Tai rolls up to their house, but Misumi reminds him that Tai's place got wrecked by the bomb, and now that they are married, he can't refuse. So Ishiro tells Tai to watch his back. The next morning, Tai wakes up from this freaking nightmare where he couldn't save Misumi from this jacked shirtless dude who had her in his grip. The shit was straight up intense, but then he realizes it was all in his head, and he remembers all the crazy shit that actually went down yesterday. 
and now he's living in the Yakuza house, which is gonna take some getting used to. But damn, he accidentally steps on Goliath's tail and gets himself sentenced to death by a thousand scratches. And everybody in the house already knows what went down just from the sound of Tai's screams. Later, Misumi's patching Tai up and apologizing for what happened. She had Goliath watching over him so his ass wouldn't get assaulted by Ashiro in his sleep. And Tai knows Ashiro would totally pull some shit like that if given the chance, so he appreciates the lookout. Misumi then picks up Goliath and starts giving him shit for hurting Tai, even though his job was to protect him. But that makes Tai nervous because he knows Goliath goes off when people touch him. Although it seems like Goliath likes Misumi because she's the boss and he'd never attack her. But the same doesn't go for Tai. Later that day, Tai links up with Futaba and begs her to help him get stronger. But she tells him they were already planning to train him bit by bit because he's hella average. But that ain't enough for Tai. The last incident made him realize he's way too unprepared to keep Misumi safe from danger. And he damn near ended up offing himself too. Since Misumi chose him as her man, he wants to be strong for her sake, which is some sentimental shit. But then Futaba grabs his shirt and starts tossing him around the room to make a point. She says she may not look like it, but she has mad martial arts talent. And even with all that talent, it took her three years of training before she could go on her first mission. So for Tai, with no talent to speak of, it's gonna take even longer to train. Just having strong emotions ain't gonna cut it. But with that said, she ain't gonna let all his motivation go to waste. So she offers him the chance to try out the Yakuza family's all-out training regime. But she's got one condition before they start. Tai's gotta live in this mansion for a whole damn month. He's surprised that's all she's asking. But she says it's because they wrecked his house. So she wants him to live here as part of his training. And then in a month, the real training begins. Tai's about to think it for. But as soon as he gets up, a trap door opens beneath his feet, and he damn near plummets to his doom. Futaba apologizes for that shit, because she forgot to mention that this whole damn house is filled with traps for spy training. So if Tai can't handle the beginner stuff the house throws at him, then ain't no training happening. Tai came here asking for training, but now he's worried he might end up dead after just one damn day. The next morning, an alarm clock goes off to wake his ass up. And it ain't no damn suggestion, either because the clock explodes after a few seconds of Tai trying to ignore it. He bolts out into the hall to escape that shit, but he ends up triggering another trap that spits out a damn flamethrower. By the time he sits his ass down for breakfast, he's practically charbroiled. Misumi apologizes for her crazy ass family, but Futaba tells him the exploding alarm clock is necessary so he can build the habit of getting up immediately. Tai takes a bite of his breakfast and asks how the hell Misumi managed to live in this house for so damn long when she's just as average as him. But she explains that she don't have to deal with any traps because they don't activate for her. Shin breaks it down for him, saying the traps can be turned off once he's been accepted by the house. They're all controlled by a computer system, so if he manages to clear every single trap in the house, then he officially becomes a member of the Yakuza family and can turn them on or off whenever he wants. The others turn off the traps when they're injured or if they just don't feel like dealing with it. And if Tai works his ass off, he might be able to do the same in like two years or some shit. Tai ain't feeling that two year time frame, but a moment later, his stomach starts acting up. And Futaba tells him he should have paid better attention to what he was eating. Everyone in the family except Misumi has their food laced with a little bit of poison to build immunity. But Tai don't gotta worry because it's only enough to turn him into an ass blaster in the morning. But one thing he does need to worry about is the fact that the bathroom door got like 20 damn locks on it for some reason. Ishiro walks by, and while he don't do shit to Tai, he's enjoying watching his ass suffer. In order to get in, Tai gotta be able to pick the lock and crack the password in under a minute, but it's cruel to expect him to do that shit on his first try. So Shinzo steps in to help him before his ass blasts all over the floor. The next day, everybody's damn alarm clocks start blaring again, and they all find their own ways to stop them from freaking exploding. Except Tai because he still ain't got the hang of it. The traps are all up in his business, trying to grab some breakfast ends up with him getting sprayed like he is in a shootout. Turning on the TV requires him to pop the button with a freaking gun, and even taking a shower almost turns into a damn waterboarding session. By the time he finally heads to school, he's straight up wiped out. His homies ask if he good, but he is fronting and says he is fine, so they leave him be. When the day finally comes to an end, 
our boy is completely exhausted. But after checking up on Misumi, he sees she has been weakening late into the night. So he covers her up with a blanket and decides to put in some extra work too. He steps outside to work on his aim. But damn he's still shooting like a stormtrooper. He dead set on keeping at it until he finally gets his shit together. But then Misumi calls out to him and asks if he want to take a break with her. They both chill inside, and Misumi pours him a cup of tea before asking if he's sure he ain't pushing himself too hard with all the training he been doing. Tai doesn't want to admit it, but she knows he's out there hustling because he think he weak. But Misumi don't see him like that. She remembers back in the day when they were neighbors, they weren't super tight or nothing at the time. But when she started junior high, she started catching heat from some jealous girls because she rocking that fly white hair streak, and Ashiro wasn't around to make them disappear. So Misumi was left at the mercy of their cruel scissor happy ways. But then Tai showed up and shut that shit down by cutting his own hair without saying a word. His move had those bullies shocked, and they ran off like scared little pups. Once the girls were gone, Tai dropped the scissors and told Misumi he was planning on cutting his hair anyway so she ain't got a trip. She still felt bad about it, but he insisted it was nothing. And from that day on, they became tight as hell. He been holding her down all this time, so she letting him know he don't need to grind himself to the bone no more. Some time goes by and Ty wakes up one morning, managing to stop that explosive ass alarm clock before it starts blaring again. He makes his way through the hallway without triggering none of them damn traps. He walks into the living room and greets Shinzo, as he once again tries to turn on the TV with a freaking gun. His aim has improved, and now he can hit that power button, but changing channels still be a bit tricky for him. So Shinzo gives him a couple of tips on reducing the recoil when he fires that gun. Soon after, Shin enters the room, and she impressed as hell that Tai can now turn on the TV with ease. She came to give Shinzo some of Tai's performance data she analyzed for him. Tai is hella grateful for all the help they are giving him, but he got a question he dying to ask. He asks Shin why the hell Shinzo always chilling in a garbage can, but the answer pretty simple. The dude is just super shy and lazy, so he hardly ever leaves that mini tank he built for himself. But that ain't the point, she tells Tai to hurry his ass up, because he's supposed to meet Nano to learn how to deal with poisonous gas. As he bounces, Shinzo says he thinks Tai got some real talent with this spy shit. But while Shin agrees he making mad progress, she knows it's all because of his own hard work. Later, Futaba and Kengo stroll down the hall and they stumble upon Tai and Nano doing nerve gas training. Kengo tries to butt in, but Futaba kicks his ass back into place so Tai can train in peace, though she senses something off. More time goes by and Tai breezing through his morning routine without a hitch. Misumi is really proud of how far he come in just three weeks of living here. He asks her to pass him the milk, but there's one thing he still ain't adjusted to, those mild poison doses. So once again he forced to race his ass to the toilet. But he also still ain't figured out how to crack the codes on the door. Kengo goes over to help him before he has an accident, but when he gets there, he finds Tai passed out on the floor. Everybody rushes over to check on him and Futaba asks Nano to get some medicine ready for him. Later on, Tai wakes up on Nano's diagnostic table, and lucky for him all he got is a fever from being hella tired. If he rests his ass for the rest of the day, he should be good, or at least he would be good if he ain't have such messed up injuries. Futaba been peeping that he hiding something for a minute now because ain't no way he achieving those crazy results without taking some drastic measures. He kept it on the down low with the help of the others, and Futaba straight up disappointed in Nano for letting himself destruct like this. Tai tells her it ain't the other's fault because they tried to stop him from going all out. But he was stubborn as hell and begged them till they gave in because he want to protect Misumi as soon as possible. Futaba smacks him on the head for being so damn foolish and not realizing that he can't take care of Misumi if he can't take care of himself first. She hands him a book on code-breaking basics, so he got something to do while he recovering from his wounds, and Tai thanks her for being so considerate. But once she bounces, Futaba thinks to herself that Tai's resilience is straight up unbelievable. Most people would break long before their bodies gave out if they pushed themselves to the edge like he did. But Tai continues to train hard for Misumi, and that might mean he got what it takes to protect her after all. 
couple days later, Ty all healed up and finally able to unlock the damn bathroom door on his own. And that's cause for celebration. And since he done beat all the traps in the house, he getting admin access to turn them off and officially recognized as a Yakuza. Futaba personally props him up for all the hard work he been putting in for the past month. But from now on, he getting that intense Yakuza family training, so he better be ready. Shinzo busts out a 100kg shirt for Tai to rock, and Shin increases the difficulty of the traps. So Tai is in for even more brutal training right off the bat. Later, we peep Miss Yumi cooking up a storm for the family, doing her usual thing by adding a touch of poison. But out of nowhere, Tai hits her with a question about putting on a bra, catching her off guard. He tries to explain he was practicing his disguises, but she ain't trying to hear it. Then Kengo shows up and offers to teach Tai, but he ends up clowning him instead. Shinzo comes through wondering what the commotion is, so Tai rips off Kengo's disguise. Ishiro jumps in saying he's about to go on a mission and tries to get a kiss from Misumi, but she just smacks him away. Turns out Shinzo's going on a mission too, and Tai's worried about him. But Shinzo says it's just some basic shit where they gotta grab the original plate for some fake cash. Tai can't believe that's considered an easy mission, so Shinzo hands him something before he bounces. Next thing we see, Tai and Misumi walking to school and out of nowhere a baseball comes flying at them. But Tai catches it like it's nothing, tossing it back with mad speed, and the coach straight up asks him to join the team. During lunch break, Misumi mentions how his training got him all superhuman-like and tells him to be careful not to blow his cover. After school, Misumi handles all the family paperwork, and Tai's mind is blown by how she handles it all. But she tells him she got used to it, and it's her responsibility as the head. Suddenly she notices something's missing, so she decides to pay Kengo a visit. Tai can't believe how messy Kengo's room is, and Misumi calls him out for forgetting to attach the paperwork to his report. Kengo brushes it off like it doesn't matter, and Tai suggests they search the room for it. But Kengo says there's no point because he never did the damn report. He comes out butt naked, and Misumi tells him to cover up in front of her. But Kengo brings up how they used to bathe together when they were kids. Misumi decides to punish him but Kengo bolts past them. Tai tries to stop him but Kengo disguises himself as Misumi, throwing Tai off guard and making him hesitate, and then he makes his getaway. Misumi activates hibernation mode, and the whole house goes into lockdown. Meanwhile, we see Shinzo sneaking through a vent, wearing X-ray glasses to scope out what's going on. He notices the security is tighter than expected, and then the director of the place rolls up. He's feeling good because things seem to be going according to plan, but it looks like there's someone else pulling the strings. Shinzo takes out two guards and manages to snag the original plate, but all of a sudden the alarm goes off. We catch Misumi and Tai searching for Kengo, checking if he's hiding with one of the other siblings, but no one's seen him. They even peep Ishiro's room, but it's just filled with pics of Misumi, so they decide to keep looking. They get joined by the other three siblings, who are curious about what the hell's going on. Suddenly it hits them that Kengo had been disguising himself as them earlier. They hear Kengo laugh and see him pop up from a damn painting, but he darts off real quick. Tai goes after him, but when they turn the corner Kengo slips away. Misumi wondered what happened, and Tai pointed to a tunnel. Misumi can't believe there's a secret passage she didn't know about, and she's pissed that Kengo got away. She lifts the lockdown and they head back to Kengo's room to finish the paperwork, but then Misumi suddenly slaps handcuffs on Tai and calls him Kengo. Tai's all confused and asks what the hell's going on. That's when Misumi drops the bomb that she knew Tai's plan was to trick her into deactivating the lockdown. She also points out how the real Tai always lets her go through the doors first. So Kengo admits defeat and agrees to do his damn paperwork. The next thing we see, Tai chowing down on some carry when a call comes in. It's Shinzo and he's freaking out because there were more enemies than expected, and he's running low on weapons. Turns out even though he's a weapons expert, he's a total wimp when he's got nothing left to fight with. So Misumi asks Tai for help. We catch Tai holding a package and sneaking into the facility, but then some dude sneaks up on him. He remembers his training with Shinzo, so he pushes back and disables the dude's weapon taking him out. More people start coming at him, and Tai can tell there are three of them. He manages to take out two, but the third one's about to call for backup. That's when we find out Shinzo gave him a gun, so he decides to use it. The damn thing shoots electricity and fries the radio. Tai makes it to Shinzo, who instantly hugs him and admits he was scared shitless. He cuddles his new gun, and Tai suggests they make a move, but suddenly they're spotted. 
However Shinzo snaps back into badass mode and quickly disarms them. They make a run for it, and Shinzo handles the guards like it's nothing. They head towards the exit, but there's a sniper and Tai takes a bullet to the leg. The dude threatens to finish Tai off and tells Shinzo to drop his weapon. Shinzo sees Tai bleeding out and tosses his gun. In a flashback, Misumi tells Tai that he can hand Shinzo anything as a weapon, as long as it makes him feel comfortable. So Tai suddenly throws him a damn fork and Shinzo uses it to wreck the dude's gun, and he was able to finish him off. They manage to escape, and they both apologize for messing up. Tai is worried because Shinzo's out of bullets, but he knows he's gotta get used to it and get stronger because he's gotta protect the family as their big brother. The next evening, we see Tai on the phone with Misumi, who's asking him out on a date, but then this damn car rolls up and some random dude shows up, so Tai straight up hangs up on her. The dude walks over and introduces himself as Seiji, a cop, and starts grilling Tai with questions. They head to the station, where Seiji pulls out a picture of Tai from his last mission, and Tai starts getting all jittery wondering how the hell Seiji found it. Seiji drops a bombshell and shows Tai videos of him during the recent events, thinking he's the one responsible for all the shit that went down. He straight up calls Tai a criminal and threatens to arrest him. But then Seiji starts thinking Tai's working with some secret organization. So he offers him a deal, snitch on everyone, and he'll get a lighter punishment. Tai ain't having none of it and says he don't know shit. Seiji tries to give him some water, but Tai knows that shit's got truth serum mixed in. So he refuses to drink it. Seiji forces it into his mouth, but Tai pulls off a slick move and catches it with a damn balloon. And he continues to play dumb. Out of nowhere, Seiji attacks him, and Tai realizes there are dead bodies in the room. Seiji explains that he just took out a drug dealer, boasting about how he's not afraid to take the law into his own hands. He grabs hold of Tai and threatens to off him, but then he spots a thread and realizes Ishiro's involved. Tai tells Seiji he doesn't know shit. Seiji's about to throw a punch, but Tai dodges it, and the punch ends up smashing through the wall. Meanwhile, Ishiro's listening in and starts making fun of Seiji's pathetic performance. Tai demands an explanation, and Ishiro reveals that Seiji is his buddy, and he's been covering up the family's activities in exchange for their help with his investigations. Ishiro asks if Tai passed the test and explains that Tai didn't rat them out, and he's looking forward to working with him. Seiji mentions he's got a big job for Ishiro so he realizes it's time for his next mission and decides to head out. The next day, Tai's dead tired because he couldn't get enough sleep, and Misumi's all worried about him. Ishiro walks into the classroom and announces he's gonna be the substitute teacher. He starts giving a lecture, and Tai's about to pass out. Then he senses a damn chalk coming at him at lightning speed. He dodges it just in the nick of time. The chalk leaves a frigging hole in the wall, and Ishiro uses Morse code to communicate, telling Tai he needs to learn to control his sleeping patterns. Ishiro starts talking about dolphins and how they don't sleep like the humans do. He says they just deactivate a part of their brain to get some rest. Dude tells Tai he needs to learn that skill, but Tai thinks it's impossible because humans need sleep to survive. Ishiro warns Tai that he's gonna chuck more chalk at him if he catches him sleeping. But then Misumi steps in and tells Ishiro to back off, thinking he's just trying to torture Tai. He's happy that she's talking to him, and she tells Ishiro to quit making Tai's life miserable. But Tai assures her that he can pass Ishiro's test. But Ishiro suddenly whips out a pellet and crushes it, filling the whole room with sleeping gas. Misumi puts on a gas mask and gets pissed off because everyone passes out. Ishiro spots Tai sleeping and starts throwing mad chalk at him. But Tai defends himself like a boss. Misumi's shocked because she sees that Tai can move even when he's sleeping. Ishiro realizes Tai's half awake and starts chucking even more chalk, but Tai dodges them all like a freaking ninja. Ishiro's impressed and keeps throwing chalk till class is over. But that night, we find out Tai can't get back into that half awake state anymore. Everybody thinks he's creepy because they see him sleepwalking and shit. The next day, Tai's reading some manual on how to date like a freaking spy. He realizes he hasn't been spending enough time with Miss Yumi, and he's scared their relationship might go down the drain. He's about to ask her out when he gets a call from Seiji. Seiji says there's an urgent mission and Tai's gotta go. So Tai heads to an amusement park, and Seiji tells him to nab a dangerous couple who's causing trouble with their guns. But Seiji ain't got no idea what they look like, so he tells Tai to be on the lookout for any shady behavior. But Tai realizes he's sticking out like a sore thumb because he's all alone in a sea of couples. Just then, Miss Yumi rolls up and says she knows what's up and she's gonna help him blend in. She even points out some suspicious peeps nearby. 
She tells him she can handle herself, so he doesn't need to worry about her. He spots this cute couple having a good time, with the dude complimenting the girl's outfit. So Tai tries to copy him and tells Misumi she can unleash some badass high kicks in her outfit, but she just tells him it's easy to move around in, and he realizes he's struggling to keep her entertained. They spot this sketchy ass couple hopping on a roller coaster, so they decide to tail them. Everybody's having a blast on the ride, but Tai ends up falling asleep because it ain't nothing compared to his hardcore training. After the ride, Misumi and Tai keep an eye on the couple, and they realize they ain't as dangerous as they front. Then they see another couple and think they look like troublemakers, so Tai decides to tail them while they hit up another ride. But out of nowhere they start going at it, making out and shit. Tai figures out they're just a regular couple getting their freak on. Misumi spots another suspicious couple, and Tai decides to peep them while they enjoy some coffee. He hears the dude talking about some special item and reaching for his pocket. Tai starts thinking he's got a gun, but he pulls out a damn ring and asks the woman to marry him. Tai's all frustrated because he ain't getting any leads. We see him holding onto a rose, thinking about making Miss Yumi happy. But then he hears the sweet couple start arguing, and he can't believe this shit's going down because they were all close during the rides. Suddenly they whip out their guns, and Tai realizes they're his targets. Everybody starts freaking out as they start shooting at each other. So Tai takes cover. He sees his rose getting blasted, and he gets pissed. He busts out his electric bullets and shoots them down. The cops show up and arrest them, and Seiji thanks Tai for his help, saying he did a solid job. But Damashiro finds out about this and looks hella upset because Tai went on a date with Miss Yumi. We see Tai and Miss Yumi chilling on the Ferris wheel, and Miss Yumi mentions how they were able to enjoy all the attractions. Tai wonders why she didn't want to ride the Ferris wheel till after they hit up the other rides. She explains she wants to peep the sunset with him. He hands her the rose, saying it got messed up in the shootout, but he still wants to thank her for all she's done. She accepts it, and they spend the rest of the day together kicking it. Back at the house, we see Shin straight up wiped out as she finally completes her mission. She's about to crash, but out of nowhere this mysterious girl hacks into her system. Shin ain't having it though, and she fights back against the hacker. We see her in the game, chasing after a freaking hedgehog, but the girl disconnects her computer, letting her escape. When she turns her system back on, she realizes the girl stole pictures of Tai. The next morning, Tai and Miss Yumi bump into Shin. They wonder why she looks so beat, and she mentions the hacker and how it's sketchy because they only took pictures of Tai, and that gives Tai a bad feeling. Tai and Miss Yumi head to school, thinking about what the hacker could be after. But out of nowhere, they get stopped by some needles, and we see the mysterious girl. Tai tries to dip, but they can't shake her, so he gets ready to throw down. The girl straight up attacks him, but he manages to push her back. She confesses her love for him, but also drops that she's trying to kill him. Misumi recognizes her as Ayaka, the Manhunter spy. Ayaka ain't feeling that nickname, but Misumi explains she uses her spy skills to track down dudes she's fallen for and stabs them with her needles. Ayaka spills that she fell in love with Tai after watching a video of him on the dark web, but it ended up putting a bounty on his head. Suddenly she tosses her needles up, and we see there are other peeps coming after Tai because of that bounty. But Ayaka starts losing it, wanting Tai all to herself. Tai drops the bomb that he's married to Miss Yumi, so he can't let himself get off. Ayaka breaks down hearing this, wishing she could kill Miss Yumi right now, but she reveals Ishiro gave her permission to target Tai on the condition she keeps her hands off Miss Yumi. Tai and Miss Yumi can't believe Ishiro would sign off on this, and Ayaka starts throwing needles all around them, but she lets them know she'll be seeing them again soon before she bounces. They make it to school, and Ayaka gets introduced as the new transfer student. She ends up sitting next to Tai, and as she's heading to her seat, she trips and throws a needle at him, but he manages to catch it. We see Tai going about his day, trying to dodge Ayaka's assassination attempts. He has lunch with Miss Yumi, and he keeps dodging Ayaka's attacks. Ayaka starts getting desperate, so she uses her needles on everyone else in the class, saying she injected them all with some mind-controlling poison. She orders them to restrain Tai, and they all hold him down, she getting ready to finish him off. But Miss Yumi steps in telling her she has crossed the line. But right then, the bounty hunter from before shows up and starts shooting at Ayaka for payback. 
Misumi pushes her out the way, and Tai busts out his gun and fires at the dude. He checks on Misumi, and Ayaka wonders why she saved her. Misumi explains she is happy because now there's someone else who sees how amazing Tai is. Ayaka sees her like an angel and falls in love with her. As they head home, Ayaka clinging to Misumi. And now she wants to kill Tai so she can have Misumi all to herself. Tai ain't feeling that, but then he gets a call from Shin. They meet up with her in her room, and Misumi spills that Shin always looking for peeps to play games with. Tai is confused as hell, but Shin starts up the game, saying they gotta defeat the enemies that pop up. They start playing, and Shin says it's time for the boss. Tai shocked it's happening so soon, but they go up against some train monster, Tai button mashing like crazy, and they manage to take down the boss. Right then on the news, they report a runaway train suddenly stopping. Shin reveals she hacks into her target systems and turns it into a game. She gotta beat the game to complete her job. She mentions she can't always do it alone and shows them a helicopter about to crash into a power plant. They get ready for the next game and they gotta battle a freaking dragon. Shin hands Tai a revival item just in case and she starts fighting against these Ashiro monsters. Tai struggling against them but somehow he activates god mode and Shin flips out yelling at him for using cheats, the dragon getting closer to the target but Shin pulls off some combo move, dodging the dragon's breath and taking it out. Tai impressed as hell, but the game isn't over as countless dragons suddenly appear, and we see that it's a swarm of drones, Shin thinking it's game over, but Tai gets an idea. He uses the revive item to bring back the dragon, and they start taking out the drones. The helicopter shoots them down, and Shin impressed it's working, but a few drones slip through, till Ayaka shows up out of the blue and takes them out, determined to get some pictures of Misumi. Tai and Shin finish off the rest of the drones, and they finally clear the mission. Shin gives props to Tai for his plan, but she insists on playing more games with him, refusing to let him bounce. A while later we got these two badass spies who just wrapped up one crazy mission, and one of them who is called Oga is taking a break and reading the latest issue of Spies Monthly, which has put Tai on the front cover. Oga's mind is blown by all the sick achievements Tai's pulling off. But Sui his partner ain't giving two shits because it ain't their mission-related stuff. Meanwhile back at the Yakuza mansion, Tai is chilling when he gets a call from Nano, who's looking for a ride home. Tai is in the middle of his workout warm-up, but he agrees to help him out and asks where he's now. And Nano spills that he is in a freaking evil lab. Tai needs a bit more info, so Nano breaks it down. This lab's been cooking up some serious bioweapons, like toxic gas. Nano's mission was to infiltrate that joint and shut it down and he freaking aced it. But now he's holding this bomb called Sodom, loaded with germs. If that shit goes off, it's gonna wipe out everything within a 10 kilometers radius. No doubt taking that shit outside is hella risky, so Nano just decides to eat it instead. Tai is a bit freaked out because Nano just swallowed a freaking bioweapon, but he explains that his body is damn good at detoxifying things, so it won't be able to kill him, but it's gonna take him about three hours to neutralize the toxic gas in his system. And as a side effect, he's gonna be knocked the hell out. Lucky for Nano, he already knocked out everyone in the lab, so there's no immediate danger. But he wants Tai to come scoop him up before those other lab peeps catch on and start hunting his ass down. Tai gets the deal and suits up, ready to roll to the lab. But when he gets there something feels off, like real sketchy vibes. He stays on high alert checking every damn corner, but there ain't no sign of security anywhere, until he stumbles upon the bodies of the security guards, and that's when things start getting really freaking creepy. The guards are already out cold, and the security system's been breached. But this ain't Nano's style, so he's wondering who the hell's behind all this. He's lost in his thoughts for a second when one of the guards who ain't knocked out aims his gun at Tai, but just before he can squeeze the trigger, this guard gets slammed into a wall by a freaking ball and chain, and the ones who saved him are none other than Sui and Oga from earlier. Sui's all surprised that Tai's on a mission here too. So they introduce themselves as part of Hinajuku, a crew of government spies. Tai's heard about Hinajuku before. Unlike the freelance spies in the Yakuza family, these Hinajuku peeps are the elite. They take orders straight from the government. Sui explains they were sent here to shut down this lab, and he asks Oga for an update. So Oga starts listening in, hearing the footsteps of five folks all up in the building. And that ain't all, he can literally smell their guns, so he knows they're packing. That info tells Sui that the main lab they're looking for has gotta be underground after all. So he says his goodbyes to Tai, because they have their own mission to handle. But Oga ain't letting the chance to team up with Tai slip through his fingers, 
he grabs Ty and drags him along. Then out of nowhere, a guard sneaks up on Ty and pops two shots at him. But Ty dodges both like a freaking ninja and counterattacks, impressing the hell out of Oga. Eventually, they make it to the lab thereafter, and Ty wastes no time rushing to Nano's aid once he spots him. But then Oga tries to straight up kill Nano with his steel ball. So Ty's gotta block that shit with his knife, breaking it in the process. Oga tells Ty to back off because it's dangerous for him to interfere like that. Their mission's all about neutralizing this lab. Ty doesn't understand why they would also want to kill Nano. Sui breaks it down that they've been keeping tabs on this lab for a while, so they knew all about Nano infiltrating the lab. And since Ty knew Nano's location, it was a cakewalk for them to find this place. But now that Nano's swallowed that bioweapon, he's become a major threat to national security. So they gotta eliminate him to complete their mission. Sui straight up tells Ty to step aside so he can off Nano. But there's no way in hell Ty's gonna just chill and watch his brother-in-law bite the dust. So Ty gets up in his face and declares that if Oga and Sui wanna take out Nano, they gotta go through him first. He's ready to blast their asses, and Oga tries to warn him to think twice, but it's too late. Sui's already activated his crazy flash skill shit and darts past Tai with his sword, slicing up Tai's gun and body in the process. He could have easily offed Nano by now, but he's trying to prove a point about how Tai's emotions are straight up weakness. He trusted these spies he never met before, and was so laid back that he hesitated to shoot them first. Oga's bitching about how Sui always acts like this, so he was about to try and stop him. But then he remembers Sui's way too damn powerful for him to handle, so he backs off. Sui walks over to Nano, promising to make his death as painless as possible. But Tai is still begging him not to do it. Sui calls Tai pathetic, thinking he can solve shit by asking nicely. But just before he finishes the job, Nano wakes his ass up and tells Sui to hold up. He explains that his body's done detoxing the gas, and he's got a patch test as proof. He doesn't give a damn if Sui still wants to kill him anyway, but he at least wants to patch up Tai's wounds before he bleeds out. Sui stops and puts his sword away because he ain't got no reason to kill Nano if he's really detoxed the poison. He says he'll take the patch test as evidence that his mission was a success, and before he bounces, he hands Nano some cream to heal slash wounds so he can treat Tai. But if Tai is really this weak, Sui thinks it might be better for the Yakuza family if he actually dies. Sui and Oga dip out, and Nanos frantically tries to patch up Tai so he doesn't bite the dust. Once Tai is back on his feet, he finds himself held captive by Ishiro, with a flame right up in his face, and he doesn't know what the hell's going on. Ishiro shows Tai that he made it to the front page of Spy Magazine again, but this time it's all about how Tai got his ass handed to him by the Hinajiku spies, they even calling it the downfall of the Yakuza family. Ishiro's mad as hell about that shit, and he's gonna straight up hunt down the journalist who wrote that article later. But for now, he's putting all the blame on Tai for the Yakuza family catching all that bad press, even though a big chunk of it's because of Ishiro's own actions. But what makes him the most mad is that Tai almost got Nano killed because he's weak as hell. If Ishiro had his way, he'd rather have Sui take out Tai. But then Nano and Misumi roll up and shut down Ishiro's bullying real quick. Misumi goes to free Tai from his restraints, but when Tai can finally speak, he says he doesn't blame Ashiro for being mad, because it's true that he messed up the Yakuza family name. Nano tries to tell him that Tai's the reason he's still breathing, but Tai doesn't see it that way because he thinks all he did was stall Sui for a few seconds, because he's weak as shit. Then Ashiro steps up and spins Tai around, and tells him he ain't never gonna do nothing significant enough to shake the Yakuza family. But if he really wants to own up to his loss, the only thing he needs to do is get stronger and get revenge on Sui. Elsewhere we see Sui's chilling on a train and tells this dude to move, but the dude ain't budging because his legs are long, and there's plenty of space for Sui elsewhere. But Sui takes it personally and straight up rips the dude's clothes apart, then walks away to find another spot like it's no big deal, and once he's settled, he finally brings up something that's been bugging him for a while and asks Tai what the hell he thinks he's doing with that hella suspicious disguise. Tai realizes he's been busted, and Sui asks if he's here to try and get revenge for their last fight, but that ain't Tai's agenda. Earlier, Ishiro spilled that the Hinajiku spies all got their own unique skills. So if Tai wants to take them down in a spy battle, he's gotta snatch every damn piece of info he can about their abilities. That's why Tai tells Sui he's gonna learn everything he lacks as a spy by watching Sui. This is the first time Sui's ever heard someone say they're gonna spy on him. 
But he ain't got no objections and says Ty can do whatever the hell he wants, but he doesn't believe Ty's gonna be able to keep up with him and his flash skill. Ty was struggling to keep up with Sui and remembers what Ishiro had told him about the Hinajiku moving technique, it's their secret way of walking silently at crazy speeds, helping them with sneaking, tailing, and combat. Sui is one of the squad leaders at Hinajiku, is a master at this shit. So Tai gotta really focus to even notice him. But Tai ain't giving up. He's gotta do whatever it takes to keep track of Sui. But damn Sui gets really annoying when Tai starts keeping pace with him. So he takes out his sword and shreds all of Tai's clothes, leaving him to get nabbed by the station police. But Tai ain't backing down. So the next day, while Sui and Oga are out on a mission, Tai's trailing them close behind, and Sui gets fed up again and slashes off Tai's clothes once more. Day 3 rolls around, and Sui and Oga are chilling on the side of a building, having their lunch, and Tai is still right behind them. So Sui takes his sword and slices off Tai's clothes yet again. After a whole week goes by, Sui and Oga are on another mission, and Tai is still tailing them. Oga's actually impressed with how much Tai's improved in just a week, but Sui couldn't care less, he moves in to slash off Tai's clothes once more, but this time Tai manages to dodge enough to save his pants from getting sliced. Sui's starting to realize that maybe, just maybe Tai's actually getting better. But he still goes ahead and cuts off the rest of Tai's clothes. Later that day, Nano walks into the kitchen and finds Ishiro cooking dinner. Nano asks if Ishiro's seen Tai anywhere, and Ishiro says he found him collapsed by the door probably because he lost to Sui again. But when Nano asks if Ishiro carried him up to his room, Ishiro reveals that he's currently using Tai's body as a damn cutting board. Nano pushes Ishiro aside and checks on Tai to see if he's alright. But Tai just laughs and says Sui got him again. Nano can't understand why Tai is pushing himself so hard to follow Sui around, but Tai believes he's gotta do this to overcome his weakness. He figures it's better to die because nobody wants a weak-ass big brother like him. Nano doesn't see it that way because from day one, Tai's always been doing shit that nobody expected. So no matter what anyone says, Tai's always gonna be cool in Nano's eyes. On the tenth day of Tai tailing Sui, he's been on his ass the whole damn day. And Sui's actually impressed, but Sui's done fooling around with Tai. He's ready to finish him off for good this time, so he gets ready to strike. But Tai's one step ahead. He grabs Sui's arm, although he still gets slashed in the process. After taking so many hits from Sui's blade, Tai realizes that while the slashes are all over his body, they always start from the center. He still can't see the attacks coming or react to them, but at least now he can survive Sui's onslaught. He throws Sui across the yard, and now Sui understands why Tai made it into the Yakuza family. So Sui ain't trying to get rid of him no more. He calls for Oga to help treat Tai's wounds. Oga comes out of hiding and starts patching Tai up. He can't believe that Tai actually managed to dodge Sui's sword. But Sui knows Tai didn't really dodge it. He just memorized Sui's moves, so he knew when the attack was coming. But even that's hella impressive. At the end of the day, that article about Tai getting his ass kicked ends up getting forgotten. But Tai's still got a whole lot of shit to deal with because now there are articles about him being butt naked all over town. And people think he's some pervy weirdo now. So later on, there's this crazy ass party going down thrown by some Baoji politicians, and the Hinajiku spies were supposed to handle some shit there. But they straight up blew their mission. The spies be apologizing to their boss for not getting it done. But the politicians have been on mad high alert lately. So it's been a real struggle to get through because the security's been tight as hell. The boss ain't even sweating it because she knew it was gonna go down like that. But she got this dope ass plan to crack their security, and it's gonna involve Tai. Next day, Tai's hanging in the park with Misumi, and he's stoked as hell to be kicking it with her because she asked for his help with some errand, but he's hella curious about what she needs all that stuff in his backpack for. Eventually, they bump into one of Misumi's old homies. It turns out to be Sui, and Tai's mind is blown. Misumi explains she knows Sui because they've worked together before, but even with that, she's still kinda pissed at him for almost taking out Tai and Nano. Sui ain't expecting her to forgive him, and he ain't sorry either because he was just doing his mission. He then asked that they hurry up since his leader was currently waiting for them to arrive. A while later, they roll up to this massive office building. But that ain't even the main base because the real Hinajiku base is the cafe right next to it. They all lock in, and Sui steps up to the register to place his ridiculously long order. When he's done he punches in a code, and a trap door opens up beneath them. Tai's mind is blown again. 
But Sui said it was only natural for the secret government spy organization to be located underground. They got a few hundred more meters to go till they reached the head office. Sui offers Miss Yumi some tea while she's chilling on his lap, but Tai ain't feeling that because she's his damn wife. But Sui says it's too damn risky to let her go alone, so he's just keeping her safe for now. And Tai sees exactly what he means because a whole bunch of arrows and lasers start flying their way. The traps are part of the Hinajiku base's security and spy training. So Tai better keep his guard up, or he'll be straight up toast before they even hit the damn floor. After some crazy ass seconds of dodging lasers, Sui and Tai finally make it to the ground floor. But the traps ain't done yet. Out of nowhere this freaking huge rock comes crashing down straight onto Tai. But just when you think he's gonna get squashed, the Hinajiku boss comes out of nowhere and straight up obliterates that thing with one punch. After that, she welcomes Tai and Miss Yumi. But she's wondering if this fluffy dude here got enough strength to keep Miss Yumi safe. They all settle down for a meeting, and we see the boss going all on the mouth watering treats that Miss Yumi had Tai haul all the way here, and she's hella grateful for that. Seems like the boss and Miss Yumi got a tight bond. Miss Yumi explains that Rin and Ishiro were classmates, so they throw tea parties with the fam every now and then. Rin can't stand hearing Ishiro's name because that sister-obsessed nut job straight up ruins the taste of her cake. But she also knows how damn adorable Miss Yumi is, which is why she wanted Miss Yumi to marry someone who could protect her from Ishiro's crazy antics. But looking at Tai ain't gonna cut it. She heard from Sui that Tai was a shitty spy. But Sui corrects her and says all he meant was that Tai was seriously like garbage at anything spy-related. Which is pretty much the same damn thing. Misumi stands up for her hubby and says he's got just as much determination as Ishiro. Rin takes it as straight-up fact. But before they can keep going with the discussion, Ishiro busts into the base like a freaking wrecking ball. He lost the signal from the GPS tracker he planted on Misumi, And he knew the only ones who could disable it were the Hinajiku spies. So he came down here straight up gunning for her. Miss Yumi already knows what's about to go down. Rin gets up to face Ishiro and tells him to bounce because his mere presence is straight up polluting the air. Ishiro refuses to let anyone chill with Miss Yumi except him, so he uses his wires to attack her. But Rin's on the same level as him. She straight up punches through his wires and straight up mocks him for trying to take her down with such a weak ass move. So Ishiro steps up his game and these two start throwing down. Their fight wrecks the base in seconds, so they gotta evacuate all the spies for safety. Damn, this is exactly what Miss Yumi didn't want going down. Every time Ishiro and Rin are in the same vicinity, shit goes down, and they start throwing hands. Sui tries to step in and stop them, but he's too damn weak to even get close. Miss Yumi jumps in between them and tells them to cut it out, but they both too caught up in their attack animations to cancel, so Miss Yumi's in some serious danger right now. Thankfully, Tai manages to yank her head down just in time to avoid getting her jaw wrecked, but he ain't so lucky himself. He gets knocked the hell out, and Miss Yumi's all pissed off. She threatens to never talk to Rin or Ishiro again, if they keep causing trouble like this. The thought of losing Miss Yumi makes Ishiro pass out, and Rin starts begging for forgiveness. But on some real shit, Rin gotta admit that Tai is way tougher than she gave him credit for. Dude took a direct hit from both her and Ishiro and survived. Her opinion of him has changed, so she wants to talk to him about something once he wakes up and gets the feeling back in his face. She wants Tai to go undercover and spy on some politician. This dude's been doing all sorts of good shit like free education, pensions, and lowering consumer tax. The people straight up love him, but Rin says a lot of his accomplishments are built on a foundation of straight up bloodshed. He's got three of the most dangerous spies in the world red, blue, and yellow as his right-hand goons. They help him with bribes, assassinations, and every illegal trick in the book to gain public favor. And with the next general election coming up, this politician's planning something big. He's been slick enough to cover up all his other crimes as coincidences so far. But they recently found one of his little bombs in an unrelated case. Though it's small, that shit can still kill someone up close. There's hundreds of these bombs out there. And even the bomb smudger they arrested don't know shit about their purpose. The only clue they got is a video of the buyer wearing a wig and sunglasses, looking like a spitting image of the politician in question. But they ain't got enough evidence to arrest him yet. So they need Tai to get close and gather the evidence they need before innocent people get hurt. Tai asks why they trusting him with this mission. So Rin explains that Kuroyori is originally from Japan, so he knows about the Hinajiku spy organization. This politician's on high alert, so they need Tai to disguise himself as a girl to infiltrate his circle. Tai gets the assignment, 
but he's confused as hell why he gotta dress up like a girl for it. Rin pulls out a job poster Kuroyuri put out looking for a chick with black hair. And that's exactly what Tai gotta look like. But before they get this mission rolling, Rin reminds Tai that the fate of hundreds of lives is in his hands, so he better not mess up. Tai manages to land the damn job, and at the next rally, Kuroyuri introduces him to his fans as Yoko. But Tai just wants to bounce and go home. Shit goes south when some folks who ain't down with Kuroyuri's policies show up, they claim all the stuff he's done only made the gap between the rich and the poor wider. So a protest breaks out and turns into a damn riot. In the chaos a speaker's about to crush some dude, but Kuroyuri jumps in front and takes the hit instead. He apologizes if they thought he had some ulterior motives, but he says his intentions are pure as hell. Even if they against him, they still representing the voice of the people. So Kuroyuri's down to peacefully listen to their complaints. Suddenly the protesters ain't hating on him no more. And everyone starts clapping. They whisk Kuroyuri away in an ambulance for his injuries, and he tells Tai to head back to the office without him. But turns out he ain't hurt at all. The whole damn thing was part of his plan to make the public love him even more. And it worked like a charm. Even his injuries were fake as hell. He starts praising his corrupt ass spies and asks to see his new approval ratings. And no surprise, they are off the damn charts. But while he's celebrating, we see Tai been hiding nearby the whole time. Now he knows for sure that Kuroyuri's as evil as they come, and there's no way he's letting him get away with it. But as much as Tai tries, finding any evidence of their crimes is damn near impossible. Just when Tai's looking through their documents, Kuroyuri and the triplets show up behind him. They ask what the hell he's doing over there. So he pulls some excuse out of his ass about trying to organize shit. Realistically, all he could do was organize because no matter how hard he searched, he couldn't find jack shit related to their crimes. They straight up committed crimes right in front of him, and he couldn't find a damn clue. Even with the bomb threat still looming, Ty is hella confused. He be watching these cats all damn day, and ain't seen them starting no evil laughs or nothing for all the shady shit they pulling. All they do is dance, and damn they straight up trash at it. But hold up, when Ty takes a closer look he peeps the game. The whack moves ain't just because they can't dance for shit, they using it as a code to talk to each other. Once he cracks that code, he figures out they talking about straight up taking down some rival crew. The next day, while a lot of important people are gathered in an auditorium, he plans to drop the bombs because he couldn't pull his usual dirty tricks on these fools. They all gathered in one spot, so he gonna wipe them all out by planting the bombs under the stage. He ain't wasting any time. He hits that button to set them off. But damn, the explosion goes down outside in the freaking fountain. Not where it's supposed to. Tay is relieved that nobody got hurt because he didn't have enough time to disarm the bombs. He just chucked them in the fountain to minimize the damage. He think he done stopped Kuroyuri's plans. But that sneaky mofo already figured out his assistant must be a spy. Ain't no way nobody should know about the bombs. So Kuroyuri pulls his gun on Tai letting him know he got some backup bombs in case shit like this went south. Then he shoots Tai in the head and sets off the secondary bombs. They blow up like they supposed to, but somehow all the people Kuroyuri wanted dead still kicking. Turns out, Tai done coated them all in some anti-shock foam before they could get hurt. That was all Tai's doing. Dude managed to stay alive because he swapped out Kuroyuri's bullets with fake ones, but he still outnumbered 4 to 1. So Kuroyuri think he got this in the bag as long as he got his triplets with him. But Tai wasn't alone from the beginning. Sui comes through dashing past everyone and slicing their guns to shreds. Once it's clear they are about to take a loss, the triplets dip on Kuroyuri before he even knows what's going down. Dude's pissed because he paid them mad cash to have his back. He's still trying to put up a fight. But as a regular scumbag, he don't stand a chance against Sui. Now that everything's handled, Hinajiku shows up to handle the crime scene. Sui asks Tai to escort Kuroyuri to the Hinajiku headquarters so they can hand him off to Rin. Tai still ain't feeling being around Kuroyuri because dude hella weird. But then this fool starts talking about how impressed he is that Tai overcame the trauma of losing his family in that accident and proved himself as part of the Yakuza family. But it's messed up because he still think that shit was an accident. That gets Tai's attention. Kuroyuri goes on to say he knows all about how Tai's whole family crashed their car off a damn cliff. And Tai was the only one who made it out alive. Some might call it a miracle. But sometimes miracles ain't nothing but man's work. All this got Tai hella curious, so he points his gun at Kuroyuri's head and tells him to start talking. He wanna hear every damn thing Kuroyuri knows about what went down with his family. Kuroyuri doesn't feel threatened by the gun, so he ain't gotta answer none of Tai's questions. 
but as someone deep in the spy game, he can straight up tell Tai that there's a whole bunch of hidden truths in this messed up world. Right then, Tai gets a call from Sui, and it's an emergency. The deputy prime minister got snatched up, and they're live streaming the whole thing from some sketchy location. They grabbed him during the chaos of the explosion and swapped him with some decoy so nobody would notice. Seems like he was the prime target all along. Sui wants Tai to grill Kuroyuri and get the lowdown on what he knows. Turns out, Kuroyuri's already hip to the kidnapping and was even planning to roll up to the abduction site. Dude breaks free from his restraints, catching Tai off guard. Then out of nowhere he drops one of his earrings, causing a massive explosion right in the middle of the damn road. Back at the house, Nanos mixing up some chemicals when he messes up a little. An explosion goes off and Misumi rushes in to check on him. But no need to stress because there ain't no bad effects except for Nano getting stage 7 cancer. But he says it's an easy fix no biggie. In a few minutes Nano zaps away the tumors and gets back to mixing. He tells Misumi he's been messing up lately because he's mad worried about Tai getting hurt on his missions. So his mind's all over the place, and that's why he started his latest experiment. Just in case Tai comes back all messed up like a mangled corpse, he's got a concoction ready to patch him up. He asks Misumi if she ain't worried about Tai too, and hell yeah, she's worried because he's her man, but she knows sitting around stressing ain't gonna help. So all she can do is whip up a bomb ass feast to celebrate when he comes back. She might have gone a bit overboard with the cooking, but she knows Tai is gonna dig it when he walks through that door. But now that she thinks about it, the house has been hella quiet lately. So she asks Nano what everyone else is up to. Nano explains that they are all tripping too. So Kengo's hustling to make a mask for Tai in case his face gets all messed up on the mission. Shin is busy exposing all the haters dissing Tai on the internet. And damn Shinzo been straight up crying his heart out this whole time. But Ashiro and Futaba they ain't lifting a damn finger. Futaba thinks it's pointless to worry about Tai because his skills are tight for a mission like this. And Ashiro well he never vibed with Tai from the get-go. So he ain't sweating it. Back on the streets, Tai finally crawls out of the wreckage holding up the driver. And the only thing on his mind right now is what Kuroyuri dropped on him. If it's real talk that his family's deaths weren't no accident, then who the hell's behind it? Right then, Sui hits him up, asking if he's good. Tai confirms he made it out in one piece with the driver, but Kuroyuri managed to bounce. Sui says it ain't a problem because they saw this coming from a mile away. He didn't clue Tai in earlier, but Kuroyuri ain't just some crazy politician. He's a former spy known as Kuragao. Back in the day, he was a straight-up legend. Official story is he kicked the bucket six years ago, but as Tao peeped, he's still alive and kicking, rocking the new name Kuroyuri. They played it low on security during transport, only sending Tai, so Kuroyuri could dip and they could figure out what his true game is. And now that they know he's heading to where they're holding the deputy prime minister hostage, they should be able to track his ass with the GPS they planted. Ain't nothing left for Tai to do. So Sui tells him he's free to bounce back to headquarters, but what Kuroyuri spilled earlier still don't sit right with him, so he got a choice to make. At the secret spot, Kuroyuri takes off the blindfold from the deputy prime minister, who's mad confused about the whole situation. Kuroyuri tells him to just relax and look into the camera since the media's probably going nuts already. The deputy's disappointed because he always thought Kuroyuri was some weird politician with that chicken costume. But finding out he's a straight-up terrorist is just heartbreaking. He tells Kuroyuri that pulling a stunt like this won't change the political game, but Kuroyuri don't give a damn about the politics. The deputy's all confused, so Kuroyuri finally decides to take off the rest of his disguise and school the deputy on what's about to go down. As the flashy glasses come off, the deputy's eyes go wide because he recognizes Kuragao, but it shouldn't be possible because the deputy saw him die years ago. Now that they got the introductions out of the way, Kuroyuri sits down and starts addressing the public. He ain't gonna speak as Kuroyuri no more, but as a father who lost his child. In his quest for vengeance, he's taken out a bunch of politicians behind the scenes. But since the deputy's the one who knows the whole story, Kuragao figures it'd be fitting to kill him right in broad daylight. Now the interview's about to start, and Kuragao points a gun at the deputy, giving him two choices. He can either confess to his crimes on national TV and watch his perfect image crumble, or he can refuse to spill the truth and end up dead. The deputy smirks because in the end, he's a damn politician, and there's no way he's spilling even if it means taking a bullet to the brain. Kuragao saw that coming, so he gets ready to blast him. But right at the last moment, the stream gets cut off. Tai, who managed to track down Kuragao, 
shoots the phone that was being used as a camera. He points his gun at Kuragao and tells him to let the deputy go. But Kuragao calls his bluff because if Tai fires now with the electric rounds, the deputy's guaranteed to get hit too. So he knows Tai won't pull the trigger. Kuragao then fires his gun knocking Tai's piece right out of his hand, but in that moment he remembers the sick training he got from Futaba and starts moving in to close the gap. Once he's up close and personal, he snatches Kuragao up, but Kuragao ain't no fool. He recognizes that Yakuza Jiu-Jitsu move and knows exactly how to counter it. He's also in the know about the special steel and carbon fire wires the Yakuza family uses, so he snags Tai's wires for himself. Tai's all confused wondering how the hell Kuragao knows his way around the Yakuza family's secret techniques. Kuragao breaks it down, saying it's only natural for a spy like him to be a pro at gathering info. But being a spy only means you're good at gathering info, nothing more. The real deal spies know how to squeeze every last drop of advantage out of that info. Tai asks why a spy like Kuragao would even bother becoming a politician just to deceive people. But like he said before, Kuragao don't give a damn about politics. He went through all this trouble for one reason only, is to get his revenge. With his skills in gathering and exploiting info, Kuragao was a valuable spy in the political world. On one particular day, right after wrapping up a mission, he was told to lay low till he got his next orders. So he rolls on home to surprise his daughter on her birthday. At first his daughter calls him a weirdo for sporting a chicken costume. But she's just messing with him. She knows he did it to put a smile on her face. Kuragao was always caught up in his business trips. So she appreciates him taking the time to swing by for her birthday shindig. She's super stoked to spend the day with her pops. But she also warns him not to send her a gift before he gets home because it'll spoil the surprise. Problem is, Kuragao never sent a present and it hits him like a ton of bricks, it must be a bomb. But it's already too late. The explosion goes off, and while Kuragao manages to survive, his daughter ain't so lucky. The organization he used to work for got what they wanted from him, so they tried to wipe him off the face of the earth. Kuragao's been dropping bodies left and right, so he ain't claiming to be no saint, but when they snatched his daughter away, he swore to make every single person involved pay for what they did. That's why he faked his death and reinvented himself as Kuroyuri all to get close to the other politicians he's aiming to take out. And now Deputy Shurasagi is the last one standing. But his time is running out. Tai tries to step in and stop Kiragao from squeezing the trigger, but he gets pushed back by the triplets who never truly turned their backs on him. At this point, Kiragao figures it's crystal clear that Tai ain't got a chance against the four of them. So he tells Tai to back off and let him get his revenge. Tai knows what it's like to have his family taken away from him. So Kuragao doesn't want to have to put a hurting on him, if Tai agrees to step aside. Kuragao's willing to spill everything about what happened to his family. Tai gets where Kuragao's coming from because he's felt that pain too. And if there's some hidden secret about the accident that took his family, Tai wants to know it too. But most importantly, he can't let anyone else die. So he can't let Kuragao pull that trigger. Just then, Sui shows up, and with one swing of his blade, he slices up the floor, sending himself and the triplets crashing down below. As he falls he tells Tai he'll handle the triplets down there. So he wants Tai to take care of Kuragao and make damn sure Shurasagi survives. Tai agrees and gets his blade ready to face Kuragao and charges at him. But Kuragao catches his hand before he can land a blow, and right away, he knows that blade was crafted by Shinzo because of its unique hollow design. It's made specifically to load poison into the hollow point so he tests it out by stabbing Tai with it. Judging by Tai's reaction, he figures the poison is some muscle relaxant cooked up by Nano. Tai's now immobilized, so Kuragao gives him a solid punch, sending him flying across the floor. Tai is left there bleeding out and lying on the ground, while Kuragao mocks him for being so damn naive to say he don't want nobody to die. Because no matter what he does, someone's always gonna end up dead like Kuragao's daughter or Tai's family. Meanwhile down on the lower floor, Sui squares up against the triplets. They can see he's got mad skills with that sword, but they still doubt he can handle all of them at once. Red's a pro at arson and terror. Blue can slash through anything with the high-pressure water beams, and yellow can straight up fry brains with electricity and mess with computer data. When these three team up, they become straight up unstoppable. Sui calls them out for being arrogant and spilling all their techniques before the fight even starts. But since they spilled their techniques he figures it's only fair that he spills his own. 
so he lets them know that the Hinajiku Technique's foundation is called Walking on Flowers. It's all about moving light and absorbent. Silence and resistance be damned. It lets you move quick as hell and almost undetectable. It's a basic technique anyone can learn. But it can also be applied to sword skills. He's confident he can handle all three of them at once. The triplets get ready and combine their techniques into one massive attack aimed right at Sui. As that huge ball comes flying at him, Sui readies his sword to counter and pulls off a perfect parry, taking down all three twins at once. With his job done, he's itching to get back to Tai as soon as possible, because he knows Tai ain't gonna last long against Kuragao. But then he feels a straight-up terrifying presence creeping up behind him. He turns around and swings his sword. But there's nothing there. Now he's left wondering what the hell just went down. Back with Tai, Kiragao asks him if he gets the gut-wrenching despair that comes with losing your family. Tai knows that pain all too well. But he also knows that through all his suffering, he had someone there to lean on. He's got a new family now, so he's ready to move on. He straight up charges at Kiragao and in his mind. Kiragao's thinking how useless Tai's efforts are because he's already memorized every damn Yakuza family technique Tai could pull off. But he ain't ready for what goes down next. As Tai's running at him, he busts out the Hinajiku walking technique, and with that shit he straight up disappears from Kiragao's sight, reappearing right behind him instead. Before this mission started, Ishiro had told Tai that a pro would have done their homework on him, so none of the techniques Tai learned would work on them. But sometimes, being too damn knowledgeable can mess up your adaptability. So even if it ain't a perfect copy, the walking technique throws Kuragao off his game. Even though he knows every move Tai's gonna make and how he's gonna make them, he ain't got enough time to come up with countermeasures no more, and that leads to his straight-up defeat. Kuragao admits that Tai beat him fair and square, and he ain't got no regrets because he always knew it would end like this for him. He gave up on everything except revenge a long ass time ago. But Tai chose to keep fighting through all the tough shit. Outer respect for his resilience, Kuragao hands him a note with info about the person who killed Tai's family. But right after that, Kuragao gets blasted in the throat. He dies shortly after, and Tai can't believe what the hell just went down. But when Sui comes back, he says Kuragao must have been assassinated to keep him quiet about some big ass secret. Tai feels deep regret because in the end, he couldn't keep everyone alive. On that note Kuragao gave him, Tai finds out Kuragao buried his daughter in a damn tree. He knew he wouldn't get the chance to do it himself. So he asked Tai to put flowers on her grave, and inside the tree knot, there's a box holding the clue Tai's been searching for. At the end of the day, Tai heads home and gets a warm welcome from his family. So even with all the messed up shit that went down, he can at least crack a smile knowing he's got such awesome people around him. A couple days later, Rin calls both Tai and Misumi to her HQ, and they all chill together as Rin gives props to Tai for completing his mission like a boss. She tells him today they celebrating by having some hot pot. They all gather around the table, and Rin piles a ridiculous amount of rice in Tai's bowl claiming she's gonna make everything ready for the hot pot. Tai asks Sui what the hell she talking about, and Sui says that every damn time Rin arranges a hot pot, she goes all out captures and hunts all the animals herself, then brings them here to feast. She walks over to this massive pile of dead ass monsters, bigger than her, and she's thinking about which meat to use first. Sui steps up and offers to chop it up for her, so Rin gives him the green light. He walks up all calm, pulls out his sword, and with one slick ass slash, he cuts up every single animal, making them perfect for the hot pot. The whole room smells freaking incredible, so Tai grabs a bowl and starts scooping out some soup, meat, and veggies, and he hands it over to Miss Yumi like a freaking gentleman. Miss Yumi's loving it and thanks him from the bottom of her heart as she takes the bowl, but before she can even take a bite, Ishiro shoves a bunch of veggies in Tai's mouth, choking the poor dude out as he lays on the ground, telling him never to try and portion food for his sister again, that honors for him and him alone. Ishiro quickly gets his own bowl of food and tells Misumi that he only put in her favorite stuff. But then Rin puts this sister-loving freak in his place by pushing his head right into the bowl, telling him to back off and stop acting like a jealous pain in the ass. Ishiro gets all pissed off, and it's game on food fight time. They start throwing food at each other like crazy while everyone else scrambles to get the hell out of the way. Oga's straight up starving and can't watch all this food go to waste. So he tries to scoop up a bowl before it spills everywhere, but he catches a fish cake to the face and gets knocked out in Tai's arms. While that's going down, Sui's keeping it cool, dodging all the veggies flying around and snatching up all the meat pieces like a boss. He tells Tai that dodging stuff that ain't even aimed at them is hella easy. 
He grabs a couple of bowls and uses his special walking technique to load them up with grub, then hands them over to Misumi. She gives one to Tai, impressed as hell, and keeps the other for herself. Sui warns Tai to be careful with the walking technique, because it takes a toll on their bones and can permanently damage them. Before Tai can even react, a hot piece of meat smacks him in the face, and he starts screaming. Meanwhile, Sui's just casually picking and choosing what he wants to eat, snatching it right out of the air. After a while, they all chow down and fill their bellies. Oga and Rin pass out on the floor, and Sui gets to work cleaning up. Meanwhile, Tai is sitting behind a shelf, staring at this little cube, wondering if he'll actually find the truth about his family's death inside, like Kuragao claimed. Out of nowhere, Misumi surprises him and plops down next to him, asking if the cube has info about his family, and he says it does. So she asks why he looks so stressed, and he tells her that even though he immediately sprung into action to protect the Prime Minister from Kuragao, there was a moment where he thought that if he found the person who killed his family, he might want to do the same and make it his life's mission to take them out. That would make him just like Kuragao. So by what right can he judge him? He's scared that uncovering this secret might change who he is. But without saying a word, Misumi plants a kiss on his cheek, totally catching him off guard. He looks at her all surprised and asks what that was for. She smiles and says she just wanted to give him a little comfort. Then they realize the cube actually opened up and a marble falls out of it. Tai grabs the marble, wondering what the hell it is. Then Ishiro rolls up and straight up claims that marble is some special device packed with optical info. But when Tai checks him out, he realizes Ishiro must have caught Misumi smooching him, because blood straight up gushing from Ishiro's eyes like a damn fountain. Dude's about to turn Tai into vapor, but thank the stars Ren swoops in, grabs him from behind, and tells Tai to haul ass. Later that day, both Tai and Misumi bounce back to their home, and Tai's feeling dead tired, his body weighing him down like a ton of bricks. Suddenly he realizes someone's literally sitting on his head, and it's none other than the assassin Ayaka. She's standing there in her maid outfit as Tai asks what the hell she's doing there. Ayaka claims Misumi asked her to crash here, and Misumi's all for it, saying she's gonna be their live-in maid, taking care of all the day-to-day -day stuff. Ayaka starts busting moves around Tai claiming she knows every damn thing that went down and even knows about the optical drive he scored. Tai asks how the hell she knows that, but she claims she's a spy and knows everything before grabbing it from his pocket. Tai tries to snatch it back, but Chen walks in, her eyes all sleepy, and takes the marble from Ayaka's hand. She checks it out and says it's not only ancient as hell, but also a bit messed up. She tells Tai it's gonna take a hot minute to extract the data from it. Meanwhile, Misumi calls Ayaka over to teach her how to make some bomb-ass tea. Tai asks if it's a good idea to have a literal assassin spy in their house. But Ayaka says it's all good because Tai's bounty's gone through the roof after his last mission. And he's getting hella famous in the underworld. That means there's gonna be a gang of assassination attempts. And he needs to be ready. So to keep him sharp, Ayaka's gonna try to off him every single day while he dodges her attacks. She starts chucking forks at him left and right, while Tai contemplates what kind of life he's about to lead from now on. Later that night, he's so damn exhausted from the training that he can't even move. Dude just plops down on the table, and Misumi offers to brew him some tea. He appreciates the offer, but says he needs to hit the shower first. He heads to the bathroom for a refreshing rinse, but then Ayaka pops out of nowhere, scaring him and starts snapping pictures of him, saying spies gotta stay alert even when they are vulnerable. She keeps clicking away and then grabs a bottle, squirting some acidic stuff that straight up burns the walls. Ties dodging and trying to get out of there, when all of a sudden, the house defense system kicks in, zapping the hell out of Ayaka in the bathtub. Nobody saw that coming. She warns Tai to stay back because it'll shock him too. Tai is trying to figure out how to save her. And then he breaks the wall and finds the main power outlet. Without even thinking twice, he jumps in the tub, grabs Ayaka, and grabs the power supply with his other arm. Ayaka is telling him to leave her be, but he keeps trying, managing to short the power supply and causing a freaking explosion. After it's all said and done, he's standing on top of Ayaka on the ground. Unfortunately, Ishiro walks in and catches him in this wild-ass situation. Dude grabs some ancient torture device because according to him, no man should even look at another woman if he's married to Misumi. Ties like, screw this, and bolts while Ishiro and Ayaka chase him butt naked through the whole damn house. A couple days go by, and Ties back on his regular missions. One day he forgets his phone, but when Misumi tries to hand it to him, she sees some person named Kaoru calling him. 
Dude yanks the phone out of her hand, saying it's nobody important, and straight up hangs up before heading outside. Miss Yumi's all confused about what's going on, and then Ayaka pops up behind her, scaring the crap out of her. Ayaka's crying and claiming that these are signs of cheating. Tai's leaving early, coming back late, sometimes turning off his location so nobody can track him, getting calls from unknowns, and straight up dodging her when she tries to follow him. She's all convinced he's cheating, but Misumi's got faith in him and tells Ayaka not to worry about it. The next day, Misumi takes Goliath out for a stroll with Tai and tells him how stoked she is to chill and spend some quality time together since he's been crazy busy lately. Tai smiles and starts asking about Goliath's breed. Misumi says this ain't an average dog. Goliath's been rolling with the Yakuza family for centuries, and he used to be her great-great-grandmother's guard dog. She claims he's a special mix of a mystical wolf and a regular dog which explains why he can shape shift. Right then Goliath straight up changes shape in front of Tai's eyes, turning into a more wolf-like form and growing in size. Misumi hops on his back, saying he's mad strong, and asks if Tai wants to ride too. But Goliath ain't having it and flicks Tai away with his tail, so Misumi ends up putting him in charge of the leash instead. As soon as he takes it, Goliath starts moving like a freaking rocket, running at insane speeds and even plowing through water. By the time they're done Tai's soaked, lying flat on his ass in a park. Suddenly, a couple of kids roll up to check out Goliath, and Misumi goes over to chat, but out of nowhere, Goliath senses something's off, and an explosion goes off. Thankfully, Misumi saves the kids while Goliath shields her, but then they realize Tai tried to save them too and took the full blast. This pisses Misumi off, and she tells Goliath to sniff out the culprit. Goliath's on it, and he sniffs the detonator and maps out a route through the city to find where it came from. Turns out it's some loser making lame-ass jokes from his mom's basement, trying to off Misumi. Dude's sitting there staring at his computer, shocked to see she's still alive, but then Goliath busts through his door, storms in and straight up ends him in an instant. Later that night, Ty gets a call, and he straight up hides it, acting all shady and saying he gotta bounce back home. Misumi ain't pressing him with questions and tells Goliath to take them back. But to their surprise, this time Goliath actually lets Ty ride on his back as they head home. When they get back, Ayaka straight up attacks Tai, accusing him of cheating. And then Ashiro jumps in to torture his ass too. But before they can do any damage, two people walk in, claiming they're government spies and say there's been a big misunderstanding. Turns out the old man's name is Kaoru. Kaoru pulls out these special dark sweet tea leaves that Tai was trying to get. He explains that Tai was just trying to score Ashiro's favorite tea leaves, which are hella hard to find. Tai went on all sorts of missions to get the ingredients but he wanted to keep it on the down low. Ishiro can't believe that Tai, the dude he's been beefing with so much, would do something like this for him. He's damn near choking himself out of shame. Later that night, they all sit down and enjoy some bomb-ass tea while talking about the future plans for the Yakuza family. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.